Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. You're welcome to church this evening once again. I trust God that by the power of His Spirit, we'll come into a clearer understanding of what He has in store for us this evening. Let's say this confession together. Say in the name of Jesus, I declare that I have eyes that see, that I have ears that hear, and my heart is open enough to receive what God has for me today in the name of Jesus. Declare with me, say in the name of Jesus, I come into fresh re- to a fresh revelation of Christ Jesus and what he has done for me today in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So last week I decided to teach um, a new series of message. Uh, usually in our ministry, King's Word, the month of June is usually dedicated to um, teaching on, um, on love, God's love. Uh, but really, like I said last week, I was going to teach on something entirely different. Um, I called it uh, soul hygiene. And uh, somehow, just before I started the series, I felt the Spirit of God moved me in this direction. I'm so, I'm so glad and excited about um, some things that God uh, decided to show me along these lines. Um, absolutely transform- transformative, revolutionary stuff. Uh, just open up your heart today. And let's get blessed together. Amen. All right, so we started to speak about offense last week and how offense works, you know, and how it gets to affect us. And then, you know, and so I like to pick up from where I left off, you know. So, you know, I talked about how, you know, the devil always um, challenges you know, uh, you know, uh, cl- I talked about the class temptation, how the devil shows up to try to tell us we don't measure up and, um, you know, we belong to a lower class. Of course, we said to talk about how the devil's rebellion, you know, we read two scriptures, prophetic scriptures from Ezekiel and Isaiah, and how they talked about how the devil fell because he wanted to be in the class of God. Now, God put him in a fantastic class. God makes no mistakes. God is, is, is all-knowing God. So he says, this is where you're going to belong. But devil goes like, hey, I want to be in this class, not this other class. And then, you know, he talked about, he talked about it in his heart and he got into trouble. And then I showed us how Cain, you know, sinned and literally and killed Abel, his brother. Why? Because he felt not as accepted as his brother felt accepted. And how this is the root, the root of offense. Is that class thing, that lack of acceptance, or what we call rejection? How it's it, the root of, of 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 offense. And of course, if God allows me today, I, I'll go a little deeper into how offense really operates. But I, I want to go probably go over a couple of scriptures that I didn't read last week. Read them this week and take you through um, in a, in a stepwise manner. And so how the root, so we said to talk about the root of offense being um, a lack of acceptance that people feel or experience. And now there is a strong connection between the sacrifice of, um, the sacrifice of Abel and the sacrifice of Jesus. And um, we saw that in scriptures, all right? So um, should I read you the scripture this morning? Thank you, Holy Ghost. So then we said to talk about how acceptance by the sacrifice of Jesus, not accomplishment. Now we're accepted by the sacrifice of Jesus, not by accomplishment. And we talked about how pride is a manifestation of foolishness. Um, and pride can manifest in two primarily, whether as a sense of inferiority or as a sense of superiority. Uh, and of course, we show from scripture, I'll talk a bit about that, how man is now in God's class. We talked about how sonship is man's greatest honor. And it is absolutely amazing. Sonship is man's greatest honor. Uh, Today, once again, I'd like us to start from one of the last scriptures we read last week. Perhaps the last scripture we read last week. And that's 1 John 3. 1 John chapter 3. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 1 John chapter 3. It says, Behold, verse 1, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should 
be called the children of God. Hallelujah. Such a powerful scripture there. Yeah, you know. And you looking looking into looking at the gospels and the life and the ministry of Jesus, and there is no better person to learn how to deal with offense um, from than Jesus. And you know, as if you look into the gospels, you see a couple of amazing things, you know, and amazing I mean, the ways that Jesus dealt with things and how he projected himself in this God class, how he projected himself as God's son. And how did you saw it? You know, like, how could you talk like that? Like, you know, you see in John 10, 30, now again, talking about the root of offense. But I want to just show you from scriptures and you see the, how, why it's so big of a deal that we have this conversation about offense. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And so we see here, right, in John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus speaking here. He says, I and my father are one. Such a big statement. It caused Ula Balu there. I mean, the, the, the Jews, they literally wanted to stone him. That How could you talk like that? How can you project yourself to be in that class? But you're not supposed to project yourself like that. But these are the things that pretty much define how Jesus operated when he was in, on, on the earth. The things that made a difference in the life and the ministry of Jesus while he was on earth. The understanding he had. He knew it. And he told them, they wouldn't want to believe. And like, what do you mean by, ah, my father are one? Do you know what that statement means? And it's so instructive that this, this concept, this revelation, that, you know, that's, that sonship is the greatest honor that man can ever claim in God. Like, I'm God's son. Like, it means everything. Now, I know it might be challenging when you look at the earthly examples around us, you know, you know, of our early, earthly fathers, their weaknesses, their limitations, and we want to consider and judge God in that life. I mean, there are people who wouldn't want to say God, um, who wouldn't be proud to be associated with their earthly father, you know, but, you know, from the kingdom perspective, and when you look at God and he calls you son, like that's the highest honor you can have as a believer, that God calls you son. And so Jesus, when Jesus says, I have my father, I won here, it, that statement means everything. Now, speaking about sonship and understanding of sonship, um, let's look at Matthew 3.17. And I'm, I'm taking you through the scriptures so you can begin to see the importance and the place and the power of understanding who you are in God and how that affects you and changes how you relate in life and gets you away from offense. In Matthew 3.17, the Bible says, now this was Jesus at the baptism. He hadn't done a single thing when it comes to earthly ministry. He hadn't done anything. They didn't even know him like that, apart from his family and folks around him. And see what he says. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He had not started earthly ministry. He hadn't done anything where ministry was concerned. And then God says, and God, where ministry is concerned. And God says here, he, this is my beloved son, you know, man, well pleased. And so the sonship is not tied to um, his functions. The sonship is not tied to his, you know, anything else around it. But it's just the fact that it is mine. And God looks at you today. He says, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called his own. He called you. He calls you his child. Hallelujah. And, and that's the highest honor you could ever have, whether you have done, you know. And so that God, because sometimes we want to be able to measure up. We want to look at a few things and then we want those things to define us. But God says here, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And God looks at you today and he says the same thing about you. And you were going to see in scripture, I mean, first John 3, he says, what man of love the father has bestowed on us. He could have called us any, many things. He calls us son. And look at how, you know, Jesus says, I am my father at one. Then God says, before he starts, he starts his enemy, God says, this is my beloved son. I'm pleased in him. And in John 14, 9, he says, he who has seen me has seen the father. Oh my God. I mean, the guys must have thought this guy is not like who talks like this. He who has he who has seen me has seen the Father. This understanding of identity, and that's why this understanding of identity that Jesus had meant everything. He meant everything. The understanding that of identity means everything for the believer. The understanding of identity means everything for the believer. I mean, people related with Jesus in funny ways. 
Je Jesus never drew his, uh, his, 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 his identity from what people thought of him. Jesus didn't draw his identity from what people thought he had, what people thought he could do, or what, how people referred to him after he had done things. You, you go through the Gospels, you see that. He drew his identity from God. I have my identity is in God. He who has seen me has seen the Father. I am my Father, well, I won, and that meant everything. Now, before Jesus go to, went to the cross, is it Matthew, Ma Matthew 23 now? I can't remember very clearly. What, see what Jesus did. did. You, know, you know that place where the, after supper, he wanted to it picked up a tower and he wanted to start washing their feet. And Peter goes, no, 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 you're not going to do this. You're not going to do this. But before all the drama and all of that, see what Jesus said. He said, he said, he said knowing that he had come from the Father and that he was going back to the Father, he bent down, took towel, and they started to wash their feet. Jesus, the, the service he was offering, how the servant leadership he practiced didn't define him. God defined him. He drew his identity in God. It didn't matter if he bent. Ben, if people saw him wiping people's, people's feet with towel, that wasn't going to add or remove from his identity because he drew his identity from God. And you see, when we begin to step into this revelation, it just affects how we we'll deal with people and how, how people see us affect us. I mean, we don't get affected by how people see us again. Amazingly, whether positively or negatively, because primarily we drew our identity from God. I mean, they wanted Jesus to be God and they wanted to make him king. All kinds of stuff happened. You know, in one place, Jesus knowing all men, he, he knew all men, he knew them, he knew exactly, he knew men. He didn't draw identity from men. Men can change, but God never changes. Who God says who you are, I mean, who God says you are is who you are. Nothing will ever change that. What you have today or what you don't have today can't change that. I say, I want you to just open up your heart this evening and really, really stay with me as I teach this evening. Because you see, it's, it's, it's just, if you feel like, how does this change anything? It changes everything. And so you realize that some, some of us, you know, we might have been a Christian for a while. And then, but you know of the certainty that you still feel inferior, you still feel less because you don't have certain things or, you know, you have certain things, then you feel all pumped up. You know, I've, I've heard people talk about, you know, you know that feeling where you have money, you know, you're comfortable, you're all relaxed and all that. And that's exactly one of the problems because you realize that you will never have enough. You see, somebody might feel comfortable today now, maybe lives in the best part of town, and then, you know, feels very comfortable since uh, it, it, his children attend, or our children attend in the best schools in the country, and this and that. Then you come around another person, and then all of a sudden you start to feel inferior, because when you begin to measure yourself up to that person, you feel like, man, I don't measure up enough. And guess what happens? That sense of inferiority kicks in. But what God actually wants us to do is to measure ourselves to who he says we are. And you realize that when you operate in that dimension, on that wavelength, offense does not even have room in your life. Because you're not comparing yourself, you know, there's no room to be jealous or envious or bitter or anything like that. All those things, because all those works of the flesh, because you don't draw your identity from how people view you. You primarily draw your identity from how God views you. Because when God looks at it, there's a way he looks at you. Let me give you an example. Uh, just imagine um, the richest man in the world, which relates with you in a particular way, feels very comfortable around you, talks to you so freely. You're so at home around the richest man in the world. Then you go around the richest man in your village and he's doing anyhow. Then he looks at you in a funny way because you mind you don't have as much as he has. Really, if you really if you're affected by it, then something is really off somewhere. Because somewhere you're you're thinking, I've been around the richest man in the world. This is how it relates with me. I don't understand. You see, there's a confidence it gives you. I don't understand why you're really, how much do you have? That's exactly how you should do when it comes to your identity in God. God looks at you, he sees you righteous, he sees you, you know awesome he calls you saints he's beloved and then why should anything else bother us but the challenge is that there's a mismatch the planes are different a lot of times and i explained that 
you know, in the course of this message. How, why somebody might say, well, that, that's different from how God views me and how people in my neighborhood see me. Uh, that's different, you know, because, you know, that's God looking at me. These are my neighbors and, you know, I feel different. And then we'll get to that in the course of this teaching. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Sonship means so much. Sonship is everything. And stop looking at sonship from, from the lens of um, not from the natural. You have to start looking at sonship with the, with the spiritual lens. Because if you look at sonship with a natural lens, you're going to have to you're going to struggle a lot with sonship. Let's quickly go to um, Romans 8:15. Let me quickly read you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 15. See what it says here. It says, for you, have, you did not receive, for you did not receive the spirit, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Daddy. By whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then ears, then hears, hears of God and joint hears with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, we, that we may also be glorified together. Hallelujah. He said the sonship affirming spirit, the sonship giving spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. The spirit didn't only, affir- you know, give you the sonship, son, he also affirms the presence of the son in your life. Hallelujah. And so you see, such a powerful scripture. It says, you know, I, I call it, you know, it came up in my heart as I studied the scripture. The sonship giving spirit. The sonship affirming spirit. You see, the sonship is about the spirit of God. We got born again. He said we were saved by the regeneration, by the renewal of water and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. All right. So the, that's Titus. Titus chapter 1, I believe. So is it one or two? Okay, I'll confirm that. You know, but you see, you see the scripture on the screen. So we're saved by the regeneration of the by the renewal of the Holy Spirit. It's just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. So the Holy Spirit it was when He moved into us, the Son came to live in us. But you see, the Holy Spirit is still in us today, affirming that sonship. The sonship of giving and the sonship affirming spirit is in you. It's constantly telling you, you're a son. He says, by the Spirit, we cry out, Abba. We cry out, Daddy. Hallelujah. Glory. And that means everything. God is your Daddy. Hallelujah. Like they say, who is your Daddy? God is your Daddy. Glory to God. It means, it means everything when God is your Daddy. You see, for a natural father, for an earthly father, you see, for someone to hear that such a person is your, someone's father, or some people go like, oh my God, that's your Daddy? But it doesn't mean you are in his will. It doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean you get the best care, but that you carry that name. But not only do we carry the name, not only are we named by the name of the Lord, not only does he call us sons, we are joint heirs. We are in the will. Hallelujah. We have just as much access as Jesus has. That means everything. That must mean something. Matter of fact, that must mean, that, that must mean everything. I'm a son. And glory to God. Say wherever you are this evening, say I'm a son. I'm a son. I'm not a slave. Say wherever you are this evening, I'm a son. I'm not a slave. I'm a son. I'm not an employee. I'm a son. I'm a son who serves. Hallelujah. I'm a, I'm a son in the employment of his father. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hey, Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. See, again, stay with me. Stay with me. Because you're like, okay, how does this affect anything? It means everything. When the revelation grows in your heart, you, this means everything. Galatians 4, 6. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Anure, yo ma wa yo si wa ti ti aye lo do do da ju da ju. Now, if you don't understand the language I just spoke, he means God's mercy is eternal. 
that you'll never run out on the mercy of God. Glory to God. Galatians chapter 4 verse 6. It says, and because you are sons, God has sent, and it says, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying out, Abba, crying out, Daddy. It says, therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an, an heir of God through Christ. You see, through Christ. Through Christ. That's the key word. Through Christ. In Christ. Because of Christ. By Christ. You know, that's what you know, you know, one song says, when he sees me, he sees, him, he sees me in him. He sees me in Christ. He no longer sees a sinner. Glory to God. He sees me in Christ. It's my perfection is not God looking at me through the lens of myself, of my behavior, of my actions and inactions. My perfection comes out of the fact that God looks at me through Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise God forevermore. I'm a son. And that changes everything. And Again, going back to Abel now, going back to Abel now, you know, I said today I was just going to go through a couple of scriptures I, I didn't read last week, and then I'm going to go a little deeper to show you a couple of things. And so, again, we're going back to establish the fact that, you see, we are sons of God. God sees us as son, and it must mean everything because the son is the heir. The son has access, right, to everything. Glory to God. He owns everything just as the father owns everything. Glory to God. Praise God forevermore. In Hebrews 11, 4, the Bible says Abel offered an excellent offering. Abel offered an excellent offering and he got acceptance. He was considered righteous because he offered an excellent offering. Hebrews 11, 4. But you see, Jesus didn't just offer an excellent offering. Jesus offered a perfect offering and by the perfect offering Jesus offered we all now <laughs> who are in Christ are righteous perfect offering not just an excellent one and I just like to read Hebrews chapter 10 verse 8 so see our acceptance with God is based on this offering that Christ offered so he offered it for you already you are accepted because of that offering and you're in a class permanently in that class because of that offering that Christ offered. You will stand. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 8 he says here previously saying sacrifices and offering and burnt offering and offerings for sin you did not desire nor add pleasure in them. See what he says here, which were offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I've come to do your will, O God. And he takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You are accepted into the program. You are accepted into the class. You were brought in, grafted into that class by the offering that Christ offered. And because of that, you should never get into a place where you allow anything to challenge that class, that you're in God class. Because if you do not allow the devil successfully challenge that, what will happen is that he won't, able, he won't be able to plant a seed of offense inside you that can grow up, that can grow to now become problems. And it's so instructive that the same way Jesus, um, devil went after Jesus with the class temptation, so to speak, he went after after like he went after the first Adam with a class temptation he did God knows that the day we read last week that you eat of this you'll be just like God ba 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 bo 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 oh and it's oh just like God but he says in Psalm 2 6 that you are gods he just didn't know God made man in his image and his likeness and so you see here he comes after Jesus in Luke chapter 4 with the same class temptation out of the three temptations in Luke chapter 4 in the wilderness, two of them, he said, if you are the son, if you are the son, turn the son to bread. Then he, come, he comes again and he says, if he, he, first of all, he says, if you are the son, turn the son to bread. Second time, third time, he came and he said, the son, if you are the son, if you are the son, twice out of three. 
is he was trying to challenge his class, trying to challenge his identity. Because you see, he's trying to draw, <laughs> he's trying to draw the devil, God, trying to draw Jesus into his mess. I was, it was Jesus, was, I was born a son. Now this is Jesus, the Jesus that we identify with now, it wasn't even Jesus that walked on the shores of Galilee. Now we identify with him in the sense that, okay, he's an example, a master. But the Jesus that we identify with, that we're connected to, now is the resurrected Jesus. The resurrected Christ. The risen King. So we are, we are born sons. We are born. You know, Jesus was reborn, right? When he was raised from the dead. That concept, that's because they're born again. Just like Christ was born again. Now we're born again and we're brothers. We, we're brethren of Jesus who was born again. And so we are born sons. We are born sons. I, if you are, you are born, you are born. You can, nobody can challenge that identity. You were born a son. <laughs> Glory to God. You were born into the family. You carry the DNA of God. There is nothing that should be able to challenge that identity. Even if you're not living the life that God ordained for you, even if you don't look like a son already, you don't look like a son yet, you're still a son. You might be behaving like a rascal. It doesn't mean you were not born into a noble family. If you were born, you were born. You were born. You carry the blood. If you're royalty, you're royalty. You might be royalty with misbehaving. You might be royalty all over the place, but you're royalty. Glory to God. You know, you can imagine somebody walking up to somebody who is behaving like a rascal. And then you say, ah, you know, this one, you're not real to you. Look at your life. Look at what you don't have. Look at where you live. He says, shut up. I am royalty. I might not be looking like it now, but that's where I am. Where I, where I am doesn't change who I am. The identity, you must never, if you do not allow the devil to challenge your identity, you won't be able to put the seed of offense in you. And but you see, devil doesn't come with two horns and all that to challenge your identity. It comes in different ways. And I'm, 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 this, I'm, let me begin to bring my thought to a close this evening. And so you see how the devil actually comes after your identity. Not with horns and, you know, it comes with regular natural things, daily stuff. That's how it comes after your identity. And that's why a lot of people don't even know oh, this is something like, look, this is challenging my identity. It's just, ah, it's just life. It's just what I'm going through. It's just this and all of that. And then the seed of offense, you know where we're going with all of this. When the seed of offense is planted in you, when the seed of offense is put into you, what it does is that it messes you up. It gets, it's like putting virus on a computer. You, you begin to malfunction because of that offense. And so you were born a son. Hallelujah. So we say, I'm born a son. I say, I was born a son. Glory to God. Hallelujah. A child of God. That's who you are. That's who you are. Just like Jesus is. You are. We are brothers now. <laughs> Glory to God. There can't be any greater acceptance than your identity. You accept it. And I was sharing with my wife. You know, this morning, and I was telling her, uh, what did I say? What was she again? I was saying her that, uh, let me try to remember, um, talking about no good acceptance. Yeah. Okay, I just even gave an example, you know, that sounds like it now. That if the richest man in the world accepts in the natural, the richest man in the world accepts, the richest man in your village, somewhere that is remote, cannot just shake you off and mess you up. Because you go like, how much do you have? You're not even the richest man in the city or the state, in the country, in the, in the, in the continent. I'm accepted by the richest man in the world. And God has, you are fully accepted. God doesn't look at you and see someone who is inferior. You are accepted in the beloved, 4 John 31. There can't be a greater acceptance than sonship. Sonship is the greatest acceptance that there can ever be. Hey, I'm a son, born a son. I'm not in the class of Moses. I'm not in the class of Solomon. Yes, very wise man. Yes, he led three million people out of Egypt. I'm not in the class of Daniel. I'm not in the class of Joseph. I'm God class. Born a son. Reborn. Born anew. I'm a son. Glory to God. I'm a son. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. A son. There can be a greater acceptance than sonship. God is not marking my script based on what I do or, where, or what I don't do to accept him. I'm accepted. Glory to God. No greater acceptance. I'm God class. 
But you see here, and this is where I'm, I bring, I begin to bring this to a close today. Where is it? A lot of people do, ah, oh, pastor, yeah, I'm vibing. You know, ah, I like what you're saying. But, you know, you know, when someone is talking and they say, but, or however, you know, whatever they have said before, then forget it. Just pay attention to what they're about to start saying. If you have been excited before, maybe don't get excited again. If you are not excited before, maybe you can get excited now. So it's negative, but the next thing will be positive. Positive, but negative is what follows after. Uh, you are accepted. And then this is where somebody comes and says, oh yeah, but here is it. I agree with all these things you have said, but I know these things. I've been teaching these things since 1975, but when did you get born again? We were the first people that collected what of Vade magazine, Ken again in the early 80s. But we live in the world. You know, I mean, the Bible says we're in this world, but we're not of this world. And, that, and I've said this, you know, myself as well. You shouldn't be so heavenly conscious that we become earthly useless. You shouldn't be, you know, a fantastic spiritual being, but a useless mental being. You know, people say all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah, I believe we're meant to be relevant. We're meant to have influence. We're meant to be significant people here on the earth. We're meant to be salt right? We're meant to be light. So yeah, I agree with all this is you're saying. These are spiritual realities, but how do they become my earthly materiality? Or if someone says, yeah, well, I know the spiritual realities, but I'm dealing with earthly materiality. Well, what I want to show you next will bless you because it will show, you cannot disconnect the spiritual reality from earthly materiality. And you know where we're even attacking this message from is talking about the seed, the root of offense. And we're saying this is how offense enters. So you need to understand, this is how offense enters. Offense enters this particular way, so you have to deal with it. Because if you don't deal with offense that enters spiritually, it will mess you up naturally. So if you, and if you have disconnected, you say, I'm fine spiritually, but these are my natural problems. No, you have to, you're a spirit being. You have to connect it. You can't disconnect it. And so someone says, that, well, the world rates you differently. And yes, I know that. The world is driven by... You know, you said, you know, all that's in the world, the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life. You know, the world is driven by this Babylonian system. You know, um, you know, the world wants to rate you on what you have materially, what you can do financially, you know, uh, where you are geographically, you know, what network you have, you know you know, naturally, and that's how the world rates, and so you, you don't have this, you know, all these Christians, so what, what do you know? I don't want to be a Christian like that though, and nobody should want to, but it is important to know how God rates you, and that's where you have to start. You have to start from the foundation, because you see, what affects you is not, maybe the devil doesn't even get as much to affect people. Maybe when the devil comes here and says, you, you what less warm, you say, shut up, devil, get out. Because on that spiritual plane, you can't, the devil can't compete with you if you have grown in revelation. Oh, I know why I am, I'm a son. But well, you know what the devil do, will do? It will now move to the natural realm and start to torment you with things around what's going on around you. So at that level, people are not thinking, oh, devil. People are thinking human beings. People are thinking earthly realities. People are thinking what part of town you live. People are thinking what salary, what salary you earn. People are thinking where your children attend school. People are thinking... What size of your organization? Uh, how many staff do you have? You know, th that's what people are thinking. So people, have not, so people think, oh, that's not the devil. These are just natural realities. But the devil uses those natural realities to invalidate your spiritual reality. So at the end of the day, people start to get into offense. And so you say, hey, well, the, devil, the offense the devil couldn't get into because it couldn't convert, con con um, um, convince you to believe you are not God's son, you are not what you are worthless or that you are not righteous. It uses natural things around you to get into offense. But the reality is that this spiritual reality must apply in earthly things and natural things. You must be able to say, even though I don't have this, I will not allow myself to think less of how God sees me. You know, I will not allow what is what is not going on around what is not going on around me to affect what I know as my reality in God. Because when you allow what is going on around you, what is not going on around you, they will enter through that place and get you to a place where you think less of how God sees you, where you now begin to unknowingly start to rate your or judge your acceptance based on what's happening in the natural realm. Glory to God! Glory to God!
And so you cannot disconnect it. You see, that's what she... What, I, I mean, this, this, I heard this from my pastor's pastor's, um, pastor's pastor several years ago. You know, I mean, and it was a conversation about um, Bill Clinton. You know, how he, he said his mother thought, taught him to live a uh, compartmentalized life. So you could separate this life and separate that life and separate this other one. One of the biggest deception of the enemy is to get you to separate your spiritual reality from your natural realities. Don't separate them. Impose the spiritual realities on your natural realities and start from identity. Make sure you get that right. No matter what is not going on around you, I will not come to a place where I begin to devalue my spiritual reality. I will not come to a place where I begin to devalue my identity and say, well, I know. We know, we all know, all these things is just in your head. No, 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 no. We must be careful while we're encouraging people to be productive on the earth and have results that we don't get them to devalue their spiritual realities and say, I understand that you're saying, how much do you have? Don't talk like that. Because you are part of the problem that will get them to a place where they now actually, I know that's not what you're trying to do. That's not what you're trying to do. You're probably passionate about them and trying to help them and all of that but don't make statements like that they are god's son hallelujah they are accepted they have the highest level of acceptance anyone can ever have because of god's child and so what we need to see is now pray for wisdom to see what to change to pray you know and approach with humility so god can open your eyes to see where you are missing it what you are getting wrong now that you start to die, doubt the identity, you know, like, uh, is it identity we want to eat? In my part of the country, they will say, she identity la fair journey, which is basically saying, is it identity we want to eat? Like, hey, what, what's identity? No, 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 identity is everything. Identity is who you are in God. And you must find, you must, and from that revelation, you'll be able to impose this on your natural realities. Because I'm establishing a revelation of how God rates me. I'm accepted. So why, you know, and but people, people don't see that. You know, we, we say scriptures like, ah, oh, God looks at the heart, man looks at the outward appearance. What do you have to show for it? And don't miss, don't no, don't miss this. I, God wants us to be fruitful. The mandate to be fruitful is a man. We plenty fill up the earth, subdue, have dominion, take over. And even Jesus said, he said, if you, he said, uh, I think it's a parable, the parable. And when Jesus was speaking, he said, oh, give me three years. And let's see if it grows. After the fourth year, cut it down if it's not growing. God wants us to be fruitful. So I'm not excusing unfruitfulness. But that doesn't change the fact that you have this identity. So what you do is to pray to God, show me. Where am I missing it? And where am I getting it wrong? And once you get that, you move up. You instantly move up. And then things begin to change around you. Things begin to change in your environment. You begin to get results where you haven't get, gotten results, but you didn't lose your identity. You see, many people, what happens is that after a while, they start to discount their identity to the point that they don't even remember their identity again. That I say, I remember. That was before I, I became wise. Now I'm wiser now. Uh, Coco, sorry, my part of the world, you know, they say stuff like that, like money is the main thing, like cash, like cash, funds. And then people say stuff like that. So, you know, forget identity. Oh, I used to be so, I used to suffer. No, 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 no. Carry the two together. Be establishing your identity and get God to show you where you're missing it. I think I'll stop here today and then I'll pick up my thoughts next week from here. There's so much I haven't said. And, but I hope, you know, you're getting blessed, you know. So next week, I'm going to pick up from here where we left up today, you know. Okay, so we know on a, on a spiritual dimension, no question. And you know, but in the natural dimension, there are questions. And that's why somebody will say stuff like, oh, uh, well, you can't compare that. that. That's a spiritual reality that God accepts me. What does, it, what does it matter if you don't accept me? It's different from uh, the natural things and what is going on around you. Don't fall for that. Don't fall for that. You need to get that straight and then we come to, but next week we'll pick up from here, show further from scripture, how this is important to the root of offense. Because at the end of the day, people don't know, you know, so they are being driven, you know, there's so much energy and ambition and all of that, but they are messed up. They have all these emotions that are negative and envy and jealousy and, you know, they strive, you know, and all of that. They're all, you know, there's the root of being has taken hold in them because of what is going on and what is not going on. And why they might even start to make progress in their lives, they get messed up because they've um, let go of the identity in God 
and then to decide to you know they, they get into this race of oh, i need to get this so i will be accepted into this place or you know allowed into that place and all of that and then they're all bitter and all messed up and devil asks them where exactly where he wants them to be father in the name of jesus we thank you for your word today uh, open our heart let us see more of these things help us to let I, I speak over everyone a fresh revelation fresh revelation of that identity in god and what god has done for them in the name of jesus amen and amen if you're not born again the first step is your identity again so wherever you are today just say with me in the name of jesus now christ paid the sacrifice paid for it already it is paid for it's not free it's paid for already for you you have access to the voucher somebody has put money in the account as well already all you need to do is accept what he has done for you if you're not born again the first step is to get born again come can come into the family of god hallelujah so 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 say this prayer with me dear god thank you for the sacrifice of your son jesus jesus i believe you died for me you died for all my sins paid the price today i confess you as my lord savior and redeemer come into my heart rule and reign in me thank you god because i'm born again thank you heavenly father because now i'm your child thank you father because now i'm in christ in jesus name amen welcome to god's family you'll see an email on the screen send us an email, send us an email if you just said that prayer uh, let's show you how you can go further in this journey welcome to god's family you're officially now my brother you're officially now my sister thank you so much for coming to god's family now if you know someone who needs to hear to this message send them the link tell them about kings of abuja channel have them subscribe if you'd like to be a part of our church family send us an email we are we're a local church in abuja but we are a global church as well so you can be a part of this church anywhere in the whole world just send us an email let us know you get know you better and integrate you into this family of god thank you so much god bless you Enjoy the rest of the evening.